Hey guys, how are you? This is Ishai Breslauer, your host of the CRE Shark Eye Show. Hope you guys are doing fantastic today. Today we talk real estate development, and we have with us Yoni back. Yoni, uh, I know Yoni for a while, and I know this conversation is going to be really interesting. Yoni, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Ishai. My pleasure, my pleasure. You know what, before we even start digging in, if you could give everybody a two-minute elevator pitch, what is Yoni Bach all about and what do you, what do, you do? Sure. So uh, I'm a developer. I'm doing uh, condo development in Upper Manhattan, mostly Harlem, and I'm starting now in uh, Washington Heights. Uh, I've done uh, four buildings, uh, condo residential buildings on my own uh, as uh, president of Kane Ventures. I'm in the process now of renovating a uh, five-story church building on 142nd Street, turning that into 14 condo units. And uh, I have one uh, project coming up in uh, Washington Heights on Hillside Avenue. Um, So I take it basically from vacant land, or sometimes we have to uh, demolish a building. And... um, and uh, we build it up, usually seven-story buildings. This, this church building is my only renovation. The rest are all ground-up construction. And, uh, you know, we, I manage uh, the construction. You know, we have an in-house general contractor. Uh, we do everything. We get the financing, we do the design, we do the construction. Then, uh, you know, we use a, a sales agent to, to sell the units. We transition it over to, uh, to ownership by the uh, condominium board. And, uh, and that's it. And then we, we pay off the bank loan. We give the return to our investors and uh, we move on to the next project. Beautiful. You know what? Let me ask you this before we start digging in, because there's so much to talk about. Uh, so many questions that I want to ask you, and we're going to get to that. Why Manhattan? Why development? Why that area? How do you, but you know what? Before we even get to all those questions, how did you, start and got into this whole business? Okay. Uh, so I did uh, civil engineering in college. Uh, I went to uh, Columbia Engineering and um, I got a job uh, working in construction management, working for Bovis, which is now Lend Lease. And um, one of the reasons that I wanted to, to work for Bovis is I wanted to move to Israel and they were working on the uh, Ben Gurion uh, airport project at the time. This was, uh, so I, I graduated in 99. I had worked for, for Bovis uh, over the summer while I was in college. And then I worked for them full time after I graduated. And uh, I worked in, uh, for first project was the Ramaz Middle School building on the Upper East Side. And when that was done, I moved into the uh, estimating department. I was there for about a year before I was finally able to go to Israel uh, with my wife. We lived there for three years working on the airport project. And then when we decided it was time to go home, uh, I went to, uh, I tried to get a job back with Bovis, but they at the time weren't, uh, weren't hiring anyone. So I got a job working for a developer in, uh, who's doing uh, condo buildings right at the start of the uh, Harlem condo market. Uh, this was uh, 2003. Um, and uh, he was doing very well. He was very successful for a number of years. Uh, buying land that at the time was dirt cheap because uh, there really was no uh, luxury developments in Harlem back then. It was just starting. So he did really well, did, did a number of buildings uh, in Harlem. And, uh, you know, I learned since it was a small, he was a small developer. I was, you know, even though I was uh, coming from a construction background, I was able to learn about development, and how, how all that works, how you get your financing and how you uh, decide which projects to do. And um, so I was there until about uh, until 2009. So, you know, 2009 came around and, uh, you know, the market had, had just fallen through the floor and, uh, you know, he wasn't able to finish some of the projects that he was working on. No, banks weren't giving financing. So uh, the company started to close and I got a job working for uh, a developer doing affordable housing in the Bronx. I was there for about two years. And while I was there, I started to look around for uh, properties to buy to go off on my own. I had a couple of investors, family, friends, some people who wanted to go in with me. And we bought a piece of property in Manhattan, in Harlem, on uh, 127th Street. We were able to get it for much less than the asking price because things were uh, you know, really depressed at the time. This is 2010. 
and um, we bought it for for very cheap. Uh, we uh, we got financing for it. You know, it was it was tough. It was a tough time to get financing, but I was able to pull in uh, some favors from people that I knew from when I worked for for another developer, and um, we were able to get financing, and we built a small boutique condo building, thirteen units on 127th Street, 5 West 127th. Uh, and by the time it came to market, the market had really turned around. We were able to sell really quickly. We, we actually sold all the units while the building was still under construction. Wow. So as soon as we got our certificate of occupancy, we were able to schedule all the closings, get it done right away. And uh, you know, we, we closed quickly and we, we moved on. We, we bought another property two blocks away, 129th Street. It was a property owned by the Mormon Church they had some old building, one story building on it that had, hadn't been touched in probably 50 years and a vacant lot next to it. So we were able to buy that. Prices were still pretty low for land back then. Amazing. And uh, we built a uh, bigger building, 20 units, 19 residential and uh, community facility space on the ground floor. The residential units also sold right away. Things continued to go up. And on the ground floor, uh, we ended up uh, finding a tenant, which was the Jazz Museum in Harlem, which was moving from their, uh, from their place. They had a very small place on, on East 126th Street, which was uh, coincidentally uh, in the office where I, in the building where I had my office when I worked for, for that other developer. Um, and we were able to uh, make a deal with them to... Um, that we'd build out the space according to their specs and try to keep it soundproof and everything because they wanted to have performances there. And we were nervous about the tenants, you know, the, the residents uh, who were buying residential buildings complaining about the noise. But we put in all kinds of soundproofing and we made deals with them about, you know, no music past like nine o'clock and, you know, certain times they, they wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, and it ended up working out really well. We, we leased it to them. Uh, they signed a 10-year lease. And uh, it actually brought a lot of prestige to the building. The, the uh, people living there were really happy to have it there. And we were able to sell it with the lease in place to a developer. So we were able to get a really good return on the building. And, um, you know, the next uh, project was uh, 17 Convent Avenue on uh, Convent and 128th Street. Um, and while we were working on that one, we bought uh, another building, uh, another uh, vacant lot, uh, two blocks north of that, uh, which is uh, 464 West uh, 130th Street, which was on the corner of convents. So we called that 52 Convent. So 17 and 52 Convent kind of went up together. We marketed them together. Um, the market started to slow down a bit. Uh, and this is like, you know, uh, 2019, 2020. Things slowed down. So we had a lot of units in contract uh, during construction, but then uh, some of the buyers were able to back out. You know, there was kind of a glut of, uh, of buildings, especially uh, downtown, you know, 57th Street. There were all that building. And that was mostly, you know, the luxury market. But the, uh, you know, the excess inventory kind of uh, trickled down and reduced uh, property values even uptown. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit and we weren't able to, uh, to do any sales for that time. So, you know, we had uh, most of the units sold, but not all. Um, we we uh, leased out uh, two of them, three of them actually, uh, because we weren't able to sell during COVID. Uh, one of them is still under lease. Uh, one of them we sold and one of them is now vacant. So we still have two units left at 17 Convent. Those are the two penthouse units. And we have uh, one at 52 Convent left. It's a, uh, it's a duplex uh, garden unit. Uh, so it's on the on the lower level. So those are the only ones we have left there. And so we have these other two projects now that we're working on. One of them is, is 142nd Street. It was a building that was bought from the Catholic Church. It had been used originally it was a convent for, for nuns. And it had been used uh, recently for uh, just for offices for the large church next door to it. Uh, we're doing that, and uh, and we uh, bought this property in uh, a vacant lot in Washington Heights because uh, we just had trouble finding any more vacant land in Harlem in, in good neighborhoods because uh, it's just been so built up. So we kind of feel like we have to kind of move on, find other neighborhoods. So I think Washington Heights is uh, is, is an, the next neighborhood in the city to uh, really start to break out. It doesn't have a lot of condos there now. It's mostly rentals. So I think uh, we're breaking ground. I think uh, there's a lot of potential there. 
we bought a property. It's, you know, it has, uh, it's a high up on a hill. It's called Hillside Avenue. So it should have good views. That's right next to the subway. Um, so, uh, you know, we're excited about that project. Uh, you know something I, about the church. I, I really didn't want to interrupt you because we got a full scope of the evolution of how your business really evolved. And that's pretty amazing. And I think one of the most incredible things is because people, when they talk about, uh, you know, working in Manhattan is, is a very unique, you know, know-how that you need there. Meaning it's a very unique type of a market. You need to know what you're doing over there. Just like in every market, but Manhattan specifically is a very, very unique type of a thing. And I think you also answered the fact, why are you in, mostly in Harlem, basically? Because you, your, your schooling, per se, was there. Meaning you worked for this, for this developer and you started doing things there. You saw how he did it. And it was uh, really underdeveloped at the time. And he came in and he did it. And you saw things as they were in the very beginning. And you evolved with it. And today it's really overbuilt, as you just described. But you had a big part of, of this, you know, uh, evolution of that area. That's incredible, I think. That's an amazing aspect. Yeah, I think uh, anything in Manhattan is, you know, going to stay strong in the long run. It's not getting any bigger. People are always going to want to live in Manhattan. You know, even when things were shut down during COVID, it, you know, things were, were a little depressed, but they didn't come down that much. Um, you know, people are always going to want to be able to take the subway. It's just super convenient and to be able to enjoy, even if they're not working in the city, uh, to be able to enjoy the, you know, the, the shows and the clubs and the restaurants and, and all the life that's there in the city. So uh, I think... You know, Harlem still is going to be a good market for many years to come. And I think uh, Washington Heights will as well, because, uh, you know, things are still reasonably priced there. And, you know, you have the subway access, you have the prestige of, of being in Manhattan. Uh, so there's just the investors also have a lot of confidence in Manhattan. A lot of our buyers are, are investors who, who rent out the units. And, um, you know, just judging by the cap rates that you get in Manhattan, uh, there's, it's considered a, a very low risk proposition to, uh, to buy and hold real estate in Manhattan. You know, we're going we, to get to the discussion about the, the market wise, you know, uh, in terms of Manhattan. Uh, we're going to return to that discussion, I guess. But at this point, what I want to ask you is, um, I want to go back to your story for a second and to ask you, there was a point of growth from becoming an employee to becoming a developer, to become, like you said, a construction guy, to think like a developer, and also getting this certain type of backing that you need as a developer. Um, it's, a whole, it's a very different world, as we know. And what I want to hear from you, if you could tell us a little about uh, the transition, how all of a sudden you became a developer, what did you need? How much equity all of a sudden you need to pull out for this? The financing, you said you, you got the financing. It was not easy. You said it yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of how that happened? I'm sure that was like the birth of your business, but it was really something that you learned a lot from, but that required a lot from you to evolve and yeah. to become something else. If you could tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when you start, you have to start small, obviously, and, and build up trust in, in your investors and your lenders. So starting off, the banks uh, were only willing to lend 60% uh, you know, loan to cost. And if costs go up, they're not going to increase their, uh, their loan. So you know, what started off at 60% turned into uh, you know, 50% by the end of the project. So, but you need to accept that. You need to accept that returns are not going to be that great. But of course, the lower loans uh, involve less risk. So your investors, uh, you know, should appreciate that. And obviously you can't take that much money for yourself in the beginning until you've kind of established yourself. So you start off small and, uh, you know, if that project works out, then you start doing bigger, bigger ones as, uh, you know, as you succeed and more investors find out about you, more people want to invest, you know, you need an, uh, an initial amount of seed money. So you need someone to at least be willing to take a chance on you. So it helps to have, you know, family and friends who are willing to, uh, to invest. It's good to have some contacts at banks or, um, you know, with mortgage brokers who are going to, you know, 
be able to speak highly of you and, and be able to, to give confidence to their friends who, who trust them at the banks. Um, so there's a, a certain amount of luck too involved with development because you're essentially betting on the market and nobody knows for sure how the market's going to do. So if you have that combination of, of the luck and the, you know, and the, the skills to get it done and the people who, uh, who trust you to, to put in some seed money, then it can work out. And then, you, you know, you take that, both the money that you've made and some of the, uh, the trust that you've accumulated and, and some of the additional equity that will come. Because as soon as someone hears that his friend made money on in an investment, you know, they want in on it. So the circle of investors starts to grow. Um, so, you know, you take that and you try to, uh, to put that into a bigger project and then, and then you grow from there. You know, and of course there's setbacks because the market goes up and it goes down. So uh, you need to be able to uh, be honest with your investors when things are going down. Don't don't shock them at the end of the project and say, you know, uh, the project didn't turn out like I thought. You got to let them know the whole time so they have at least that confidence that uh, you're not uh, pulling the wool over their eyes. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, if you can show them that overall you you do well and when the market turns bad at least your projects didn't do that badly and uh when they do well you know that you you know that you're doing really well for them and, and making really good returns for them and uh you know if they have that confidence they'll keep investing with you in the future you know something you saw you went through meaning maybe not yourself but you saw firsthand how the recession how you know everything happened in 2008 to the guy that you were with and you came out of that. How did that affect you in yeah. terms of the fear factor to see how he got hit so hard? And then you said to yourself, okay, I need to now come out of that and I need to find financing and I need to find equity and I need to get this done after I saw the other guy really get hit hard. Obviously, you came in in 2010. There was no better time. Everybody talks about it today, obviously. We, you know, every event we go to says it's not 2010. It's not, we, we, everybody says it for the past like 12 years. So um, it was great timing. But at the same time, the fear factor was there. Nobody said in 2010, hey, it's 2010. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, that's the yeah, whole key. No, it, was, it, was, it was terrifying. I mean, that's, you know, the nightmare scenario. But I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, one thing that I learned is not to be too highly leveraged. You know, developers, including the one I was working for, uh, they often had these, you know, crazy financing structures where they would, you know, get your bank loan. The banks were lending like, you know, 80% at the time. And then they would take a mezzanine loan on, on top of it for another 15%. Wow. And, and they were only putting in like 5% of the equity themselves. Um, and, you know, lenders were just, Kind of assuming that real estate would keep going up and they were you know being quite irresponsible um uh, of course when you do that you know if the project goes down and, and you're in 10 percent less than than the project yeah. cost then of course your equity is completely wiped out anyone who, who invested with you is completely wiped out and your lenders you know these mezzanine lenders are often uh you know they're, they're sharks they'll they'll come after you they'll take your stuff you know your your personal they'll come after you personally and uh, that's what happened. And it was, uh, you know, it was very tragic to see because there was someone who I was working for who was like on top of the world. And he had this, you know, this Ducati dealership at liquor store. He had a you know, condo in Florida and, and pretty much everything was gone by the end of it. And it was very Oh, sad. my gosh. So you have to prepare for that bad scenario. You have to only borrow, you know, what you're absolutely certain, even in a downturn, you'll be able to pay back. Um, you have to warn your investors that, you know, real estate is a risky business. If, if they're not, you know, professional investors, uh, then you need to be honest with them and explain that to them because they may not realize that that's a possibility. Um, it also uh, showed me that you have to know what you're, what you're getting into. In other words, um, if you're used to doing uh, residential buildings, you know, you start getting involved in something else where, uh, you know, one of the projects that I was working on was basically turning a commercial building into residential. And we did all the work before we got the permits. You know, that's a very risky thing to do. Yeah, we're going to get uh, to that. I want to speak about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, um, you shouldn't try to be a hero with the bank in terms of what the costs are going to be. You should always take out a loan that's bigger than what you actually need. 
because, um, you know, at times like that, when, when, you know, credit markets tighten, they're not going to give you more money if things cost more. So you're better off taking out a bigger loan and getting more equity than you otherwise need. And, um, you know, of course, that, that eats to your profit a little because you're paying, you know, you're paying points on the loan, even if you don't draw the full amount. Of if you take out a $20 million loan and you only draw 15, you know, you're paying fees on the 20, but it's still small compared to the overall project. And, uh, you know, you'll have that extra $5 million in the event that costs go up, um, you know, because sometimes even if, if costs go up, even if the sale price uh, is going to go up too, you're not necessarily going to be able to come up with that extra $5 million. So you really have to be cautious and you really have to prepare for the worst case scenario. Uh, because, uh, you know, at, at times like that, when credit markets tighten, it's also, you're not going to be able to raise that additional equity because people aren't investing in times like that. So, um, you know, it's a scary, uh, it's a scary thing to have to go through, but, um, you know, you got to prepare, prepare for that. Right. And good that you learned it that way. It's phenomenal. Yeah. I'll tell you a quick thing. I mean, I shared this story a couple of times, but um, there was once I was invited to dinner, a, a Friday night, a, you know, Shabbat, you know, for a Shabbos dinner uh, on a Friday night. And um, friends invited a bunch of people. And uh, one of them was, was, not, uh, was interesting enough. It was uh, I didn't know who that man is. Came in, was very old at the time. And uh, I didn't know who it is, but, you know, when they introduced everybody around the table, I, the person who came in was extremely old and he had help that came, came with him. And uh, he was a close friend of the family. And when they introduced themselves, I introduced myself also as a real estate guy. And all of a sudden the guy said, everybody said, hey, uh, do you, he's in real estate for years and years. It was Jerry Hines uh, uh, from Hines, meaning the, the mega Hines you know, uh, corporation, obviously the founder of this company. And I sat right next to him. So I felt the privilege. I said, if you could give me like one tip, uh, you know, of how you did things and how you got it done to, to get it from, from that point to the other. He was, ext- he was really old at the time. He passed away, by the way, uh, throughout COVID. I don't think from COVID, I don't know, but he passed away. He was already very old. Um, and he said, it was very nice. He said, the method that we have done things, and they are huge developers, he said that we, we, we took no more than 50 up to maybe 60%, uh, you know, leverage. Loans. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Debt. And everything else, I said, what, what was everything else? Because you're not talking about a $10 million, 15, 20, $30 million project. You're talking about, I don't have to tell you what we're talking about. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of projects in prime, prime location. And he said, we take it all equity. We have a lot of LPs and a lot of great partners. So he said that that was the main key of how we surpassed every single downturn. So, yeah. so that, that's the very similar to your experience yeah. in your own way. Um, it's a good long-term that's, strategy. Yeah. Why? You know, in the short, in the short run, the people who are super highly leveraged, they look like geniuses. You know, and they, you know, double and triple their returns, you know, but then as soon as things go badly, you know, the geniuses turn into, you know, reckless uh, fools for, uh, right. for, for risking everything. You're, you know what? I want to shift gears for a second. Um, you're doing development in Manhattan. That is unique. A lot of people doing real estate nowadays for the past few years are talking about, especially during COVID, talking about the resilience of multifamily. And uh, you are not there. You are in development. And you're in development in the most, I would say, um, in a place where COVID hit so hard. And there's so much entails in doing development, especially in that area. Can you tell us a little bit about your take on development versus the multifamily aspect that everybody talks about, the investment that is more, I would say, the safe haven or, you know, the income producing type of a thing. Tell us a little bit about the strategies and about your thought process about that. When you say multifamily, you mean just purchasing uh, rental yeah, buildings yeah. Yeah, as an investment? Exactly. That's what I mean. I, I right. mean, you, you went to development, condo yeah. development, especially condo development. I'm assuming it's all condo, right? It's all sales. 
you own some for the most part yeah for the most part i mean uh, as i said you know we rented out some units that we weren't able to sell during covid and we rented out the jazz museum uh until we were able to sell it but the end goal is to sell um and so, uh, you about know, this. so you know it's it, it's creating something you know instead of buying and selling you're not adding value you're just sort of investing um so you know, I came from a construction background, so I enjoy being able to actually build something, create something from nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's money to be made during construction, uh, as opposed to when you're just buying, you know, it's hard to justify, uh, you know, a salary if all you're doing is just buying and selling, you're not actually creating anything. Um, you know, uh, your returns are obviously a lot higher. In development, you know, people are you know, in Manhattan, you, you buy and, you know, get like four or five percent uh, returns uh, on a, uh, That's on a right. family purchase, uh, you know, with uh, developments, you know, you're hoping to double the money, you know, if things go well, um, or at least try to get, you know, 15 percent uh, ROI. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's riskier, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's potentially more rewarding and it's exciting and it's, uh, you know, it gives you, it gives you a good sense uh, that you're actually creating something, creating housing in, in Manhattan, which is still, you know, New York City does need more housing. America needs more housing. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something good that you're doing, even though, uh, you know, developers often get a bad rap. That's right. And tell me something, Yoni. Um, when you come to develop you know, and you come to look for a good project, what is your formula of success um, when you come and look for a deal? So, uh, you know, I'm getting pitched properties all the time. There's uh, all these uh, investment sales brokers who are sending me, sending me properties. Um, you know, of course, it has to be in a good neighborhood. Not every neighborhood is ripe for condo development. There's a lot of neighborhoods where, you know, people aren't going to buy. They're not going to buy right next to the uh, you know, Metro North trains, which are so loud, and they're not going to want to buy next to housing projects, homeless shelters, things like that. Um, so it's got to be a good neighborhood. Uh, obviously, the price has to be right. You want it to be a, of a certain size because, um, you know, if a property is too narrow, even if you could build really high, you'll have such a big loss factor between the stairs and the elevator that, you know, if you're paying a price per square foot, half of that square foot is, is getting lost to common space. It's not sellable. So you want to, you know, you want it to be at least 50 feet wide. Um, you know, I always run it by the, the brokers who sell the sell the condo units at the end and say, you know, is this a, uh, a place where you'd want to uh, be selling units? Uh, obviously, the price has to be right. Uh, you know, so you do a pro forma, you do uh, a budget. You know, how much is construction going to be? How much are they asking for for the land? How much can I get for it at the end uh, sale price? Uh, and, you know, based on the financing that you think you can get at the time, what's going to be the overall return and how much are our investors looking for in terms of our return. And uh, if the numbers look good, you put in an offer and, uh, you know, you try to negotiate the best offer you can get. If you can come to a deal, great. If not, you know, most deals uh, don't actually work out for one reason or another, but you try enough deals, uh, you get a few that, that work. Tell me something, working with municipalities, is always a challenge. And Manhattan is known to be, you know, the city of New York is known to be fairly tough. What is your experience with, uh, you know, with them? And how did you gain confidence in doing the right stuff there? Tell us a little bit about that. So it's extremely difficult to deal with the city. It got even worse during COVID because you couldn't walk into offices. Everything had to be done uh, remotely, which... You know, made it hard to really push, you know, expediters are, are experts in trying to, you know, really push people and get the, the various bureaucrats to do what you need to do. And it's a lot harder for them to do that when everything was remote. Um, I mean, you have to take into account when you're doing the pro forma that there's going to be these delays caused by the city. From the time you buy the property, you, you design it and you, uh, you know, you get a, everything approved and your permits, you know, take a year and a half. And uh, that has to be built into your to your model for the, for the project. Um, what's good is if you go buy a property like the one I bought in Washington Heights, where there were already a set of uh, DOB approved plans. 
Um, the plans, it was designed more as a rental building. So we're going to revise those plans to make it more of a, a condo. But at least we're able to pull the permit based on the old plans and we get started. And, you know, the excavation is the same excavation. Uh, while we're doing the excavation, then we can work on revising the plans. But at least this way we're able to get started and shave a lot of time off of the schedule. Um, the, uh, the church building on 142nd, I thought would go a lot faster because it's an alteration instead of a new building. The problem is that it was so difficult getting landmarks approval since it's in a landmark district and then going back and forth between landmarks and the building department that it ended up taking a really, really long time to get started. So uh, this is just something it's, it's one of the risks that you deal with and, you know, a risk that you can try to mitigate in, in various ways, like trying to get a property that has approval. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big cost and a big, uh, you know, part of the schedule, not just at the beginning of the project, but at the end, you have to get your certificate of occupancy, there's tons right. of paperwork involved, inspections. There's how also, you know... I wanted to ask you, I'm sorry, I'm stopping you. I just wanted to ask you, how instrumental with this whole process as a team? You have to use the right attorneys, the right expediters. Yeah, 100%, all those things, you know, the right architect, the right, you know, your employees have to be good and you know, over time, you uh, you develop a better and better team. You start uh, swapping out people who aren't performing and you, you hire people that come highly recommended. And, um, you know, if you get a good team together, there's still risks. You know, you still have to deal with the city, but, um, you know, a good team can get things done faster. You want to use people who have worked together before so they have a good open line of communication. The architect and the engineers and the expediters, you know, all these people should be talking to each other. It's good to have a lawyer that... Um, you know, is very responsive to you and will get back to you and, and one that you trust. Um, there's just, you know, a lot of, a lot of different people who are involved in this and, uh, you know, having a good team who, who communicates well with each other, who trusts each other, it goes a long way to getting things done. Tell me something. Tell us a little bit about the financing environment today and your experience with that. So it's, uh, it gets better and worse. Um, right now, uh, you know, rates are, are still pretty low. Uh, it's just, you know, they, they raised things a quarter point a few months ago. It's expected to go up a little bit. But rates are fairly low and banks are lending like 65% typically uh, loan to cost. Uh, they also have complicated formulas for determining uh, based on the, the value of the sales, how, how much they're going to lend. So you have to both have, you know, there's a loan to cost and then there's a loan to value. Um, you know, typically the banks are going to want 1%. If you go through a mortgage broker, they're going to want, they want 1%. Sometimes you can negotiate lower fees. Um, there's, you know, non-traditional lenders too, who will lend you much more, but they have higher interest rates and, uh, you know, they have all kinds of uh, clauses, you know, if things don't work out, they're going to come after you personally. So, um, you know, I go mostly with traditional lenders, uh, say for that way. Um, but, you know, if I, if I do bigger projects, there's a limit to how much I'll be, you know, I'll be lent from traditional lenders. So I may need to go to some non-traditional lenders as well. Um, mezzanine loans are a le lot less popular than they were before, you know, 2008. Uh, I know they still exist, but, um, you know, a lot of times banks, the primary lenders don't want to lend to you if they know you're going to have a mezzanine lender because they don't want to get involved in a whole litigation if the mezzanine lender doesn't get paid. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's something that's done, but it's not, uh, it's not typical. Uh, sometimes there's seller financing for, for some projects. They've, they've pitched that where the seller says, you know, they want to make some money on the deal. Right, popular. So they don't want to do it themselves. They don't have the uh, the expertise, so they'll sell it and uh, and and do some kind of financing. There's also you know land leases. Uh, I, I was involved in one project with a, a former employer where there was a 99 year lease. The problem is that uh, if you have a land lease, if, you, if the uh, if the sponsor, the developer doesn't own the property, you can't put a condominium on it because you can't subdivide the, uh, the tax lots if you don't own the property. So in that case, you would have to do it as a co-op and co-ops typically don't sell as well as, as condos. Uh, so I, I've, I've looked into it on a number of projects. I've never done one uh, uh, on a land lease on my own. Tell me something. Um, you know, when you look at this whole scope of, of, uh, of where Manhattan is in terms of development, you have the different areas and you were in hell. And, and right now you're going to Washington Heights. 
Tell us a little bit about that market. Why are you going there? So, you know, I'm trying to do basically what the developers did back in uh, 2002, 2003, which is go to an emerging market where prices are still fairly reasonable and uh, develop it and, and take advantage of all the upside potential that comes from a neighborhood where uh, things haven't fully gentrified yet. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of potential in Washington Heights. Uh, it has a lot of uh, great retail there already. You know, it has the subway. It's part of Manhattan. It's, it's part of the island. So there's, you know, real potential for, for having prestige there. Uh, it has a lot of nice rental buildings. It's just not, not that many condos. Um, and I think, uh, you know, you can still sell for a lot less than you'd have to sell in Harlem to, uh, to make a good profit. So the potential is there. So the potential is in Washington Heights. Very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. When you, meaning you're dealing with different sizes of projects, obviously. What is the largest project you had to deal with? And what is the difference between, you know, a larger project versus a smaller one? So the largest project I worked on when I, before I went off on my own, I worked on the Bariqua Village project in the Bronx, which was uh, eight buildings, a mix of uh, market rate and affordable housing, and a very large steel and glass building for Bariqua College. Uh, so that was, you know, that was a huge project. It was three city blocks that were merged into one uh, that had a huge team on it. Um, you know, that's a lot different than uh, the projects that I'm working on now, which are mostly seven story single buildings. Uh, you know, there's no big team to rely on. You kind of kind of doing things myself. I have a super in the field. I have a, a project manager in the office. Um, it's, it can be very stressful, you know, not having a, a big team to hide behind. Everything is kind of on you. Um, and uh, it, it's hard to get the efficiencies that you get from a large building in the economies of scale. Uh, you know, even a small project, you still need to manage it. It's almost the same amount of work to manage a small building as it is to manage a large one. Um, you also don't have the same kind of amenities available for the building that you would have on a large building. You know, a, a, a large building can afford to have a doorman in it because the cost is right. split among so many units. Right. Technologies so you don't have that are doorman. obviously more you have a, You'll have a small gym. You're not going to have, you know, a pool and all these other things that, that the big buildings have. So you can't sell for the same price that you would sell units in a very large building. So that, that makes it a little more challenging. So you have to buy property for, for less. Tell me something. Do you use uh, in your system, you're a construction guy also. So, you know, obviously, if you could tell us, you know, from your experience and what you actually do, the difference and uh, what you do in practice versus taking a GC or using it as an open book system, like uh, CM wise, or are you doing it a turnkey uh, type of a thing? What, 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 is your, what is your take on those? So, you know, I, I do it all in-house because that was really my background. I was a project manager for many years in construction. So I don't have to spend whatever the GC fee would be is, a, is now part of the project. So it makes the project more usually, profitable. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know, and there's, you know, the fee that's in the contract. Then there's also the hidden fees that you get, you know, right. depending on how you structure the contract. If it's a lump sum, <laughs> you have no idea how much the GC is actually making. But whatever the GC would be making is now going into the project. Uh, you also have a certain amount of control. You know, you make sure that the subcontractors are not just the cheapest ones, but the ones that could actually do the job and do it well and, and get it done uh, in a timely manner. And, uh, you know, you have a, a good sense of what's going on. You know, if corners are being cut, you have a better sense of that. If suppliers are not being paid, you're going to know about that and not find out about it at the end of the project when you see these liens on the project. So um, I, it's, it's a lot better to do it yourself. I saw that when I was working for a developer who had his own in-house GC. Um, it's just uh, it, it's more efficient. It, things will go faster. You don't have things getting lost in translation going through different parties. So, you know, it's still the, you're still going through subcontractors, but, you know, you hire the superintendent directly. You control everything. You oversee everything directly. And, uh, you know, you're able to, to control the project much better that way. Tell me something. Do you have the desire of making larger projects or 
more of the same, but many more. Meaning, where are yeah, you on that? I, I, would growth aspect. I, would yeah. I would definitely like to do, yeah, I would definitely like to do larger projects. As I mentioned, there's that efficiency. You have the economy of scale. You have the, the better amenities that you could do. So I think it is more profitable to do it that way. The problem is, you know, you finish one project, you know, you want to, to do a bigger project, you have to kind of finish with all your projects and then you have, you know, a bigger, you know, pot of money to do one big project, but then there's kind of a lag, you know, it's hard, it's hard when you're doing everything yourself to have like a lag, you know, over a year or two where you're not, uh, you're not pulling in money. So, um, you know, slowly I hope to grow and, and do bigger and bigger projects. Um, you know, the kind of slowdown we've had in the market from the last two years, that kind of slowed my ability to grow the, the company because, you know, investors are, are more reluctant to invest in, uh, in projects when, uh, you know, the last project didn't uh, get them the return that they were originally right. hoping for. Right. So Tell as the market improves, uh, I hope to grow it back up. Let me tell you, re uh, rezoning wise, are you, have you done rezoning with one of your projects? Uh, no. Um, you know, they, there have been some rezonings in Harlem, but mostly they're rezoning properties that are not so desirable, like, you know, along Park Avenue, which is along the uh, Metro North trains, you know, they rezone that area. Um, you know, if they happen to rezone a property after I already own it and upzone it, you know, that's basically like hitting the lottery. Um, right. But, uh, you know, a property that's already in the process of rezoning, no one's going to want to sell it because they're, they're going to hold on to it themselves, hoping to, uh, to make the money on the rezoning. So right. I, I never had the, the fortune of owning a property and then all of a sudden it, it uh, got rezoned up. Right, right, right. It's a whole different, it's a whole different process uh, within, within the process. Um, yeah. Very, very exciting. So when you look today at the market in Manhattan, it's something and that's something I would like to close with. And uh, I see that you believe in the market. I see that you know uh, what you're doing. I see that you were there for many, many years. Um, but at the same time, we saw what happened to Manhattan during COVID. And so and people fled out. And people are actually moving to the Sun Belt. Uh, and now Manhattan is gaining a lot of people coming back, right? It's, it's, uh, some people say it's 75%. Some people say it's 85% to 90% already in terms of the residential, you know, moving back aspect. Uh, it's not fully there what it was pre-COVID, but it's getting there. It's, it, and it's going to get there without a doubt. But it's, it's, it's still in the process. But there's one thing that Manhattan has, and I want to hear your take on that. Manhattan has, meaning people who move to Manhattan usually move because the business world is still in Manhattan, meaning that's the realm of our time. It's still there. It's still, it's still that. Um, and uh, the office market, which is not something that you do, is the primary, I would say, driver of Manhattan. So every single residential aspect you have in Manhattan is because of that aspect of office. Um, anything, any comments about that? Yeah, I don't know if uh, the office is the only uh, driver to Manhattan. Maybe it's, you know, for, you know, for, for family men, for, you know, for people like us, maybe. But, um, you know, a lot of people really love New York for the culture, for the museums, for the arts, for the, for the uh, Broadway, the nightlife. You know, it's got the best restaurants, the best right. uh, social life. That's a big driver. It has so many universities here. There's a lot here besides offices that will uh, drive people to the city. And really, in the entire United States, there's no city that has quite as much. Uh, Nothing like NYC. In That's terms of entertainment and art. And everything. That's right. So it, it's always there. I, I, and, and the offices, a lot of them are coming back. You know, some people don't want to come back, but a lot of them are not being given a choice by their employers. So um, there's, you know, maybe to a certain extent, some some people have gotten so used to working from home aren't going to want to come back. But there's always going to be a market for it. Um, and there's some of the uh, office, office space might get converted to other uses, but uh, there still is a, a huge uh, office market here. And, uh, and there's a lot of other things besides the offices, um, you know, just... People like being where there's a lot of other people. There's been a, a move to um, urbanization, you know, before there even were offices, you know, that, that's been going on for, you know, for a thousand years. People have been 
shifting from rural to uh, to urban life. Um, and that, you know, I think that'll continue even if people are, are working. They'd probably rather be, if, they're, if you're working from home, you know, would you rather be working in the, in the suburbs so that you, there's nothing to do even when you're finished working? Right. Or would you rather be in the city where, you know, it's a lot easier to date, it's a lot easier to go and have fun and be with That's other true. people. So uh, I, th- I think the, uh, the market is coming back. Um, I think that, uh, you know, most people are going back to work. Not everyone. Most people are going back to work. Colleges are opening up. The nightlife is opening up. Um, you know, I, there may be another wave, who knows, but it'll eventually pass and things will come back. And, you know, I think um, Manhattan always comes back. It came back after 9-11. It came back after the right. uh, financial crisis. I agree with that. It'll, it'll come back and it's already coming back and it'll, it'll continue coming back. Yoni, before we start our goodbyes, if you could tell everybody how they can find you and you guys can see the links above or below. But Yoni, if you could tell everyone how they can find you if they're investors and they're interested in your activity or uh, partnerships of some sort, if you could uh, share with us how they can find you. Sure. Sure. You can go to caneventures.com, K-A-N-E-P-E-N-T-U-R-E-S.com. You can uh, fill out the contact in there. Um, you can, I, I just finally uh, caved and joined LinkedIn after uh, everyone telling me to do it for years. So yeah, I, just yeah. that up. I, didn't, I didn't set up my profile and everything yet, but you can find me there. Um, and, uh, you know, you can get my, my number, my email address, a quick Google search. I'm sure you can uh, pull that up. Or, in, in your uh, website, I, I, like you said, I think your website is the primary uh, place, meaning LinkedIn, you're new, you'll get there. But in terms of uh, the website, can, uh, can people reach out to you there? Meaning is there your yeah, email address? There's a, there's a contact page there. You can also uh, email me, ybach at caneventures.com. Um, you, can, you can reach out to me there. You can get, I think, my, uh, the office phone number is on the, uh, is on the website too. If you, Excellent. If you call. So. Yoni, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Shai. It's a really interesting conversation. And uh, thanks for, for having me on. No problem. My pleasure. And you guys, I hope you enjoyed it and you've learned a lot from it. 